Sure. Ready? Starter. There we go. Hey. Excellent. Okay. Well, it's a great pleasure to introduce colleague Dr. Diana Smith, who was early on in the um, Geographies of Risk podcast. Can we get something together and do an episode request line? And um, we had a great conversation. And so this is um, it's it's a pleasure to have you contributing to the seminar series and um, talking with the assembly and and whoever whoever joins in later to watch the videos um, post facto uh, to talk about food systems, your work in food systems. Um, and it's it's great to hear this from you because you come to it from, um, I think, a really interesting perspective of sort of um, not just the geospatial questions, you know, your your background in, in geospatial analysis, but also like a, a deep understanding of um, of sort of the you know the the social context in which those geospatial analytics exist um, when it comes to food security and food access. So thank you for joining us today. Over to you. Thanks, Eli, and thank you for the invitation. Um, as you know, I could talk about this for quite a long time, but I will constrain it today. I've got about thirty slides, and I will try to stay on topic as much as possible. But with that said, you know, please do feel free to put your hand up and ask a question. This does not have to be some sort of formal lecture. Goodness knows I can do whatever you like. So the remit was looking at geography's risk and trying to link this into food. And my work is very much around food and food, especially in a developed setting like the UK in this case. Um, it stretches back this interest probably about 20 years. That's the truth. I started working on it in Oregon for my master's degree and looked at food deserts, which is access to healthy and affordable food in areas in which you perhaps see under-resourced in terms of retail food. And really the, the discussion has moved on so much. So obviously here in the UK, we have different topics, um, although food deserts still are certainly of interest. And we're looking at food in a different concern around food insecurity and household food insecurity. So I'll talk about that a little bit today. Um, but as Eli says, it really goes across, you know, I, this is why I did GIS, I have to say, as those of you who know me well know that GIS was not my first love. I wanted to be a qualitative researcher and talk to people. And then I ended up kind of falling into GIS as a result of food. And here we are now. This seems to be what I do most of, um, although I've now reemerged into doing qualitative work again, which I really enjoy as part of a, kind of an ongoing series of projects linked to food. So today I'll try to keep it as succinct as possible. I'm happy to take questions and hopefully give you a good overview of what I understand about food and food systems. So there's all these different aspects of the food system. I could bring in lots of colleagues who know more about kind of upstream food systems like MRO, um, but today I'm gonna to focus in very specifically on the individuals within the food system, and I mean individual consumers, and the barriers these people, us, we, might face in terms of accessing food and accessing food of the quality that we need. So I'm gonna try and focus on household risk of food security. And I'm going to go over all these things re relatively quickly. Um, what is household food security and what's the risk of food insecurity? What do we know about it here in the UK? And I will focus very much on the UK because that's what I'm looking at now most regularly. What are the health impacts? It's kind of the why do we care question. So it's like food deserts 20 years ago. If they're a thing, do they matter if they don't harm anyone or is it just an inconvenience? Well, no, there's health impacts, and there's certainly health impacts of having food insecurity as well. But that's obviously the thing that often kind of clinches any sort of policy involvement. Why do we have this risk? Why is it that in a country like England and the United Kingdom, people are still food insecure right now? How do we measure it? Or do we measure it? And what do we do about it? Which, of course, is the really important question. So it's wonderful to do all these things around conceptualizing it, thinking about it, measuring it. But so what do we do? So another kind of so what question. So what is food insecurity? I'm going to draw, draw on Liz Dowler's work. Um, Liz Dowler has been doing this area of research, again, stretching back to food deserts and the right to food, and then food insecurity, and it's also known as food poverty. So you might hear the, food, the phrase food poverty used instead. The kind of technical version is, it's the inability to access a, a sufficient diet through socially acceptable means due to financial constraints. So in more simple terms, it's not being able to go to Tesco in the evening or name your supermarket and buy what you want for your evening meal. 
needs because people tend to be constrained financially and can't meet their needs in the kind of traditional way. It can also encompass the kind of associated anxiety and sense of unease around not being able to maintain a healthy diet for yourself and your family. Um, so food insecurity is the term which is used most often in the rest of the world. Food poverty is one that's used here in the UK much more often. Um, my colleague Claire Thompson, who's a predominantly qualitative researcher, and I are writing a book on food insecurity this year in our spare time we don't have. And one of the comments that came back was, do you want to call it food poverty or food insecurity? And we've landed on food insecurity because conceptually we're talking about the same sort of thing. Um, food poverty works quite effectively when you're trying to get people to react to the situation, which is that a lot of people in this country don't have a sufficient quality diet because they can't afford to access it or they can't get to it physically. So I will probably swap back and forth throughout the presentation, but food insecurity is the one that you tend to see used most in the literature. And you can see food insecurity conceptualized at like national level. So what is Brexit going to do for our food system and our national food security? We import a heck of a lot of food from elsewhere. Or we can think about it in terms of community food security. So the kind of lovely ideas I like around enhancing community food security, like developing more community gardens or making more allotments easily available. Uh, or getting people to dig up their front garden like we did and put a vegetable patch if I have a front garden. So all these ways to kind of enhance individual food security and wider community food security are important um, as well. But here we're focusing very much on household level food security. What can we do to support people to have better food security in their own homes? So what's the story? Well, it's not a good one. Um, I've talked to a lot of people who work in food banks recently and different sources of food aid, and they all tell the same story, which is there's increasing demand even before COVID. And we talked about this last night in another seminar, and one of the questions came up was, is food security going to be an issue? And it's like, well, yes, it is. Here's the data to kind of indicate this. Um, and it's not data I particularly love using because it's looking at food bank use. And what we know is that not a lot of people use food banks. You can see on my slide here, there's a statistic about that. Um, looking at research in Canada, which is a very similar system to the UK, only about 20% of people who would self-identify as being food insecure use food banks. So we don't want to look at food banks as a measure of who's food insecure in a country. Um, in the UK, we know that looking at data from the Food Foundation, who've, who've surveyed the country as well, kind of a representative sample, we know that more people are now using food banks than used to if they are food insecure. So we're up to about 50% of people who would identify as being food insecure, not being able to meet their needs, um, are using food banks. But still, that's only about half, right? Not a great turnout. But here's the data to show exactly the kind of demand we're talking about. The top graph, the rainbow colored one there, shows the demand on food parcels from the Trussell Trust, which is the largest franchised food bank across the UK. So this is UK-wide data. You can see back in 2015, they handed out 1.1 million food parcels. So that's going to have repeat clients in there as well. And I can see that Maya's here as well. She can certainly give you a different perspective having volunteered in a food bank, the Southampton City Mission Food Bank. So she might want to add in a bit more insight in this case later on. But then up in the most recent year, they have data for ending in April 2020. They had given out 1.9 million parcels. And can I just remind you that's just before the first, or that's just after the first lockdown, they started to capture data. When you talk to people running food banks across Southampton, Dorset, Hampshire, um, Portsmouth, the story is very much the same, that it's on the increase. It has been for some time. So pre-COVID, it was already going up, and now they've seen even greater demand. It's interesting that the demand is not always going up. In some places, there, there was a dip after the initial kind of um, demand post first lockdown, so around April to May 2020. And this is because so many other charities have now become, become active in terms of trying to resource food to people. So although the food bank data may not be a perfect measure of food insecurity, as well, food, in, food, data, food bank data is not going to capture the full scale because people don't all use it. And there's so many more food aid charities now that are occurring taking place through, say, schools, through ind independent restaurants. I think we've all seen examples of local restaurants here in Southampton that are handing out food, especially over the school holidays to families. So all that all that kind of demand that would go to food banks is being met elsewhere currently. Um, and yes, food insecurity quadrupled during the first COVID lockdown. So people were already food insecure. More people got became food insecure as a result of this first lockdown. The bottom graph there shows data from the Independent Food Aid Network. And the light blue line at the bottom is the demand in 20, 
19 and the dark blue at the top is a demand, sorry, 2019, yes, and the dark blue at the top is a demand in 2020. And you can see there was a definite spike right around the first lockdown in terms of the percent increase in demand. Um, and I won't give you any specific data locally, but it's, it is just really shocking the amount of people who are now turning to food banks, which is very clearly not the first choice for a lot of folks in order to meet their needs when it comes to food. But why is this happening? Let's take the pandemic aside. That's been a disaster in and of itself for a lot of people. Why is this? Why are we seeing such a rise in food insecurity in the UK, in this wealthy country where we've got free public health care and everything, all sorts of wonderful things happening? Well, it's a complex story, and I'm going to just go through a few examples. One of them, starting with inflation. So just basically, things cost more, and we're not seeing our wages go up by as much. So these are measured between 2003 and 2013, so a bit out of date now. We can see general inflation sitting at about 30%. Housing's gone up by 30% as well. It's a heck of a lot more now. Um, food up 47%, fuel 153%, and then wages are lagging behind it with an increase of 28%. And again, that stops in 2013. We know that things have gotten even more challenging since then with the onset of longer term austerity measures. There's also been a lot of loss of manufacturing jobs. And there's a lot of people who are on low pay or on zero hours contracts and insecure employment. Generally, there's a lot of people who are what we would term underemployed. So they're employed well below their capacity. Mostly what we see is people are shocked into food poverty. So the pandemic was certainly a big shock for a lot of people, but it's exactly the same kind of shock that lots of folks encounter all the time, which then tips them over the edge from just about managing, as Theresa May would have said, to suddenly not being able to manage anymore. And this is something like losing their job or their car breaks down or they own their own home and that's fantastic so you can take a mortgage holiday if you're lucky enough to do that but then the boiler breaks down and boilers cost about two thousand pounds to replace and you've got to have one so all these kind of unexpected expenses and keep in mind there's a lot of people in this country i forget the exact percentage but it's a fairly fairly shocking proportion of the population who have fewer than less than 100 pounds in savings so unless you have savings you're going to be in serious trouble. In addition, for people who are in the private rented sector, there's often annual increases on rent, or you might have to move out because you can't afford the rent anymore, then you have to go somewhere else and come up with a new deposit. So there's all these kind of additional costs. Um, one that's come out overwhelmingly from some more recent qualitative work in food banks is that relationship breakdown is really driving a lot of people into difficulty. And I don't know if that's just post pandemic and the kind of pressure of being around each other so much, but this is a known issue. It's just one that, which is emerging much more strongly across Wessex as people are turning to food banks because they now have a, they were already low income and now the buffer they had because they were a two person, two adult household has been lost. Illness, of course. So even before the pandemic, illness, mental illness, physical illness, change in welfare benefits. So we've had the rollout of universal credit, which I'll pick up on in a minute. And as well as that, there was the uh, creation of personal independence payments of so people who were collecting disability living allowance were shifted onto personal independence payments. And the challenge with that from talking to lots of welfare advisors is that most of them are much worse off. And frequently, many of them were then their benefits were stopped because they had an assessment over the phone and it was determined they should be able to work. Therefore, they were not entitled to personal independence payments. The appeals process for PIP takes up to a year. So people are on a much lower income without any resources for up to a year, plus all the kind of associated anxiety and uncertainty around that is really problematic. And then I've mentioned the poverty premium, and I've got a picture of one of these lovely electric prepay electric meters here. So the poverty premium is the fact that if you don't have a great deal of funds easily at your, disposable, at your disposal, then what you find happening is you end up paying over the odds for the same sort of thing. Um, so, for example, if you pay for electricity through a prepayment meter, per kilowatt hour you're paying over, you're paying much more than someone who's on a regular kind of direct debit payment. We see the same thing with payday loans, which were a tremendous problem until recently, it still are. Um, and also, do you remember those kind of shops where you can go and buy a television and pay $15.95 a week and it ends up costing you about £500 for something worth about £200? These are all indicate. these are all kind of examples of the poverty premium. So when you don't have good resources or a lot of savings or access to credit, these are the kind of things which have a, a kind of cumulative impact on your household finances. Then I've drawn in some research from Universal Credit on universal credit from the Trussell Trust, which was just showing that in areas where the full universal credit was rolled out, and it rolled out in waves across the country in a kind of catastrophic way for a lot of people, um, there was an increased demand on food banks, and we've seen 
again, overwhelming research to support this. In addition, when you speak to people working in local authorities, you hear stories about the amount of rent arrears that have gone in, that have gone up as a result of universal credit rollout. And not to mention the, the five week wait to get universal credit. So you apply for it, but then you have to wait for your benefits to start for five weeks, during which time you can very kindly get a loan against your future universal credit payments, which then puts someone into more debt. So it's this kind of debt cycle as well, which is very problematic for a lot of folks. And that's why when you look at the data from, say, Trussell Trust, you see that a lot of it is driven by long term low income, but also these kind of shocks and then um, delays in benefit payment. And uh, delays in benefit payments. Previously, it was also sanctions on universal credit, which were much more common until recently. So it's not the most uplifting picture, is it? It's a kind of scenario of if you're struggling, you're going to be struggling for a while, and there's not many ways out of it. We have seen the uplift of £20 a week on universal credit, and that's just been extended for another six months in the most recent budget announced today, which is um, helpful, but that's £20 no matter what your household size is. So a one person household is going to get 20 pounds and a five person household will get 20 pounds. And now let's get to the first, why does it matter? Does it, does it actually make any difference to your health? And the answer is yes. If you have episodic food insecurity, if you're not able to maintain a healthy diet, and typically what you see is that people's food quality and diet quality will dip towards the end of the month before the next payment is due, then that leads to a lot of longer term health problems like higher blood pressure, which can then lead on to cardiovascular disease. Um, poor quality diet is also associated with obesity very strongly. If you look at the eat well plate, it's all about fresh fruits and vegetables, low carbohydrates, you know, small amounts of protein. And if you look at what is cheap and affordable food, it's typically high processed, highly processed, high carbohydrate. Fresh fruit and vegetables are lovely. And I know they're not terribly expensive all the time. But if you're trying to fill 2000 calories a day off fruit and veg, it's going to cost a heck of a lot more than if you're doing some of the cheaper pre-processed foods. And there's a plethora of research led by colleagues such as Adam Dronowski in the US to demonstrate this quite effectively. In addition, I've given you a whole series of reasons as to why anxiety and depression are going to be a problem as well. If you're waiting to hear back about your benefits claimant, your benefits claims or your appeal process, um, or you're worrying about how you're gonna feed your three-year-old who keeps asking you for food, then of course, anxiety and depression are going to be a very natural impact of this. Um, some other research has shown that people who have gone through the benefit claimant process, especially in universal credit, are reporting higher levels of depression and anxiety as well. So we're gathering more and more evidence, which is a bit thin on the ground, as to what the actual health impact of food insecurity is in the UK. The data is much stronger in the US where food insecurity has tragically been a problem for a lot longer and there's more data collected. Again, this is a recent BBC News story just picking up on this. Um, and this was not 13 hours ago, I took the screenshot last week. But here's someone saying that, you know, my benefit top up is a lifetime lifeline. Don't take it away. And every person profiled in this article reports the anxiety and depression associated with the uncertainty and having to use food banks and running out of money on a regular basis, especially people who were previously employed and who are used to being able to do what they need to, and, you know, buy what they want without having to worry about it or think about it. Now there's a very different situation and scenario, which leads to a lot more anxiety and depression, especially. And this is something which I think is easier to measure sadly, because it, it develops very rapidly. It's not like cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes or even obesity, which might take a bit longer to, to be established. As I already mentioned, the evidence is quite thin on the ground, um, especially for here in the UK, because as I'll tell you in a minute, we don't even measure food insecurity. So how are we supposed to measure the health impacts of food insecurity? If I sound a bit annoyed by this, I am, and I'm not alone in this one. Um, but what we again can do is look at research more widely in Canada and the US where there's a longer history of measuring food insecurity and then exploring the health outcomes related to it. So in addition to what I've already mentioned, if we look at, again, um, malnutrition very specifically, we can see there's very clear impacts of food insecurity or episodic food insecurity where you run out of food sometimes on maternal nutrition. And that's because parents nearly always shield their, their children from food insecurity. So if there's limited amount of food in the house, and that's one of the ways we measure food insecurity, most will go to the children and the parents will cut back on their own meals, skip meals entirely, skip days of eating in order to feed their children first. This also has a knock-on impact for women who are breastfeeding and obviously will have a, a detrimental impact on the infant as well. There's also been increased hospital admissions for malnutrition, especially older adults across um, the UK and we do have some evidence towards this and there are some teams working on this across Dorset as a matter of fact. So let me catch my breath for a minute. I get very excited thinking about this in a way because it makes me quite angry and I just want everyone to understand the kind of situation we found ourselves in. So 
where, where are we? We have emerging new evidence from organizations like the Food Foundation and the Food Standards Agency and DEFRA that people are having a difficult time in the UK meeting their needs in terms of their diet and that lockdown and the COVID pandemic have caused even more challenges in terms of accessing food. I personally think that one of the tragic side effects of the pandemic is that more people now understand what it means to not be able to get the food that you want. For different reasons, we went to this, the grocery stores and suddenly there was hardly anything on the shelves. Um, I went to Tesco at the end of our road towards the very beginning of the first lockdown and there was no fruit or vegetables apart from a whole bunch of avocados. And it was really shocking. And I think most of us have not experienced that, but that's what the reality is for a lot of people. The food is there, but they can't buy it. And for the rest of us, it was just a matter of suddenly the food wasn't there at all. So I think this was a bit of a reality check for a lot of people around what the what the real experience is for many people across the country every year. We also saw that, look, again, drawing on data from the Food Foundation, um, which is what I'm referencing here, already food insecure households were experiencing more and more limits on their diet quality and quantity. And this especially impacted negatively on their mental health as well as their physical health. So there's emerging more research around especially the impact of the COVID lockdown. And this is from Understanding Society data as well. So we've got Food Foundation data doing their own survey and then Understanding Society, which is a national longitudinal survey that did a special COVID um, boost sample and picked up on food insecurity specifically. But it's not just about people, it's also about where you are. And I couldn't resist putting a bit of health geography in because of course what we see is that we have to think about the local resources to you. And so we've talked about food insecurity from an economic perspective, but of course, where you live is going to influence this as well, because how affordable is the housing where you are? Is there very much social housing available? How affordable is the food which is available to you? Um, is there an Aldi or a Little, if that's going to be more helpful to you than perhaps a Waitrose and M&S? I live in Leamington, we've got a Waitrose and M&S, um, and then a very small Tesco and a slightly larger Tesco. So it very much, you're going to be influenced by a retail food environment. My colleagues and I would argue that you need to also look at the food aid environment, which I'll get into shortly. And that is what kind of affordable food or free food is available to you locally, like through food banks or food pantries, for instance, or even now mobile food larders. Because what we see is that when people are relatively poor and they live in an area which is itself deprived and probably doesn't have the nice amenities like better schools, nice green space, good places for physical activity, good transport links, then there's this, this impact of deprivation amplification that was first described by Sally McIntyre in around, I think, 19... 97, which feels like um, not that long ago, but I realized actually was quite a long time ago. So you've got this kind of compounding effect of people who are already worse off living in areas where there are fewer amenities and fewer resources to support them. And again, if we go back to the food desert work, we can see that in more deprived areas, and there was a recent study from an undergraduate student here in Southampton on Southampton's food deserts, um, food was in fact more expensive in more deprived areas of Southampton because the shops that were there were corner shops, you go to some areas, there's no big supermarkets, so you're having to go to these corner shops and food is much more expensive in these locations. So um, how do we know what the situation is? Well, right now we don't actually know in the UK. There's a couple of national surveys that have been put in place, but this was a long and ex kind of excruciating campaign by lots of different groups, including End Hunger UK and Sustain and the Food Foundation to measure food insecurity systematically in the UK. Um, there was a Feeding Britain report in 2008, and this is what kind of inspired me to do some work in food insecurity specifically. And they said that what we need to know is understand, what we need to do is understand the spatial extent of hunger and food insecurity in the UK, and currently we have no idea. The good news is, as of 2019, the first data were collected using the Family Resources Survey, which is administered by the Department of Work and Pensions, and reaches about 20,000 households. The data are due to be replaced, uh, sorry, released on the 25th of March, but there is some skepticism as to whether that's actually going to happen or not. And you can see here, the measure is range, ranging from mild food insecurity to severe food insecurity. And this is measured using a series of questions that were created in the US by the US Department of Agriculture. And there are variations of it, but it's either six or 12 questions about, have you skipped a meal in the last period of time? Usually it's 12 months, but you can also omit it to four weeks. Have you skipped a meal? Have you cut back on the size of your meals? Have you worried about food? Um, have you ever felt hungry and so on? And the answers to these questions indicate the food insecurity. And that will now, hopefully the data will be released very soon, but it's also um, similar questions have been integrated into more regular surveys. So what do we do about it? Getting back to the next one. So we've gone through the, what to scale the problem, 
Then we've talked about, so what? What are the health implications and why people become food insecure in the first place? And then how do we measure it? Now, what do we do about it? And the main response so far in the UK has been to use a food bank. So these have some, these is something with a very long history in the US and Canada. The first food bank in the US was 1967. In Canada, it was 1982, and here in England, 1999, just down the road in Coventry, as a matter of fact, or Salisbury. Anyway, just down the road from here. And 1999 is, of course, much more recent, but we have seen a huge number of food banks since then. As I mentioned, the Trussell Trust is the main kind of franchise model of food banks, but we also have many other food banks from the Independent Food Aid Network. It's probably now at about two-thirds Trussell Trust, one-third Independent Food Aid Network. And... What is difficult, and if you talk to any local authorities about this, what they find most challenging is it's really hard to know how much informal food aid is going on. So how many churches or places of worship are giving food to their to their uh, parishioners, clients, I was going to say. Um, how many schools are giving out parcels of food to the families, because that's not always captured either. And then beyond that, what about all the kind of people that are just being generous and helping out others by putting out food free in front of their house? Or what about the Olio app, which allows people to share food easily? So there's all this kind of unknown food aid happening, whether they're a pop-up food bank for one day a week that someone's just doing out of their back garden, or whether it's something that's just a very kind of ephemeral food bank that might only be around for, say, two or three weeks while there's people to stock it, or another intervention altogether. There's a lot of demand for people to, understand, to know more about this, especially in Southampton. So if there's any undergraduate students who are looking for dissertation topics, I would really recommend getting in touch because I've got a whole series of questions from the city council around food security, community food security, individual food security, that they would like answered that would make a very nice, tidy undergraduate or master's dissertation project. Problems with food banks. Well, I say that and I don't mean that there's a problem with food banks. I would say the problem is the stigma associated with them. The food banks are something which have emerged from the third sector. So they're a charity or civil society, you could say. They are crucially not part of government aid. So they're there in addition to what you get through the benefit system, for instance. Food banks in the UK are traditionally only accessible by, by means of a referral system. Um, so you have to get someone else to say you need one and then you get a voucher. And they used to be bright red vouchers like that that Trussell Trust used. So you get a referral from, say, your GP or social worker or your school. But you can imagine a lot of people we know from qualitative work are not very keen to ask for help because they don't want to be flagged up as not being able to feed their children, especially if they're going through any kind of custody battles with uh, an ex-partner. This can be really challenging. And that's just the kind of practical side. Many other people simply don't want to ask for help. And that's where the kind of non-referral, the informal food aid can be quite beneficial for them. But again, we can't measure that. So there's no indication of what the scale of food insecurity is in the country because we're not measuring it regularly and not everyone's using food banks. The vouchers are also limited. So in Southampton, Southampton City Mission is a really generous food bank and will give out five or six vouchers per year. Traditionally, Trussell Trust has limit, limited it to three per year. And each voucher from Trussell Trust usually lasts for three days for the household size. And for Southampton City Mission, it usually lasts for about five days. So again, they're a more generous version. And we're lucky because Southampton City Mission have five food banks across the, across the city. And there's one open every day of, this, of the working week. But again, we have an issue of access here, don't we? Because what if you're in work? And guess what? A lot of people who are in food poverty or food insecurity are in work as well. So you're then trying to access a resource which isn't actually there when you need it necessarily. And it's only accessible five times a year, five days. We're looking at, you know, 25 to 30 days a year of food at the most. So the issue of access is still very much there. And again, I'm not criticizing food banks because they are responding to demand that no one else is. Also, food banks exist where there's capacity, where there's volunteers to, to work in them, where there's somewhere to have the food and to run the food bank out of. Um, and typically they're in churches. Trussell Trust is a Christian charity, so that gives them a, a nice resource base to start from because there's plenty of willing volunteers and there's plenty of spaces. And we do, see, we do tend to see that most food banks are run out of churches for this reason. But then this leads to the question, are they always where there's the greatest demand? Because if they're where there's capacity and there's a volunteer sector available, is that necessarily going to correspond with where there's the most need? So how can we understand these kind of questions around food aid, food insecurity, what's driving food insecurity, what are the health impacts? Lots of different ways. You can use ethnographic research and go and do some observational studies like Kaylee Garthwaite did. She spent 18 months at a Trussell Trust food bank in Middlesbrough and wrote a book about it. It's a very good one. I'd recommend it. 
It's a nice, succinct story about how people end up in food insecurity and then how the food bank helps them and what we need to understand more fully about this. There's qualitative research, so you can do go long interviews and spend time with families. And there's quantitative analysis, which is analyzing data, whether it's primary data you've collected or secondary data from national surveys, which is where I fit in. So I'm going to very briefly talk you through one of the examples of projects we've done around food insecurity. Um, and this is some work that I've been doing for about five years now. It started back when I was at Queen Mary still. And it's looking at a measure, a small area measure of food insecurity risk, kind of like the index of multiple deprivation, but very specific to food insecurity. And that's in collaboration with Claire Thompson, who's a qualitative researcher. So with Claire's help, we went through all the kind of, kind of background research around food insecurity to see who defines themselves as being food insecure. You could use an income cutoff, but I'd argue that's not appropriate because you don't know what money, what people need to spend their money on. They might be able to live rent free somewhere, for instance, or they may have be able to make savings elsewhere. So we've chosen people who self-identify as being food insecure. My other colleagues are Kirk Carland, who worked for the Health and Social Care Information Center for quite a long time, and Nicholas Shelton, who's a professor of epidemiology at UCL, and also has a very long interest in food insecurity and works at, and volunteers at a food bank. So again, it's very it's like the index of multiple deprivation in that it's based on area area level data about individuals and we focused it on two different age groups the under 65s and the over 65s and it's very much informed by these in by historic qualitative work and ongoing qualitative work so we're actually in the process of updating it right now um, with funding from nihr applied research collaboration to find out how we can tweak what currently goes into the model to make it more applicable in the current time and the, it was published first in 2018, but we do update it regularly and it's available freely online, the measures are. The data sitting behind it are based on the census and thank goodness we're gonna have a new census soon so we can update this more meaningfully. Um, and we looked at the high risk households for food insecurity. So we've got two different domains. We've got high risk households and we've got people claiming benefits and we combine the two together. And high risk households again informed by qualitative work. And this is the thing that's ongoing and being updated now is for the under 65s low income households with either single adults or with dependent children, because again, no buffer for single adults and dependent children put more of a strain on resources. And low income is defined as being routine, semi-routine or long-term unemployed using the um, NSSEC classification. For 65 plus populations, we, we isolate the households which are for single adults only. Then we bring in the benefits claimant data. So, the Department for Work and Pensions very kindly releases amazing data sets grouped by under 65 and 65 plus, which is immensely helpful because unlike the first few iterations of this particular model, um, the benefit counts no longer double count people who, who claim multiple benefits. So for example, if you claim job seekers allowance and housing benefit, previously we'd have to download selectively only a few benefits and, and use those in the model. And now the benefit claimant count by working age or pension age ensures that no one is double counted. So everyone only, only goes in once and they fit into the different kind of benefit combinations or other. Um, so we use this to indicate the proportion of the population either under 65 claiming benefits or for age 65 plus claiming benefits, but we exclude anyone over the age of 65 who's claiming the state pension only. So you can use these two different domains either together or separately. And I'm gonna give you an example now of how this has been used in, I think, let's see, I think it's Suffolk and Southampton. So the areas that are colored, the core path map sitting behind it, indicate relative risk in terms, not relative risk, the risk in terms of quintiles. So the red areas are the highest risk for this particular local authority. And I should have mentioned it's all at middle super output area levels. These are all roughly analogous to half award for those of you who work in local government or are familiar with it. Um, and we use as a, as a proxy for neighborhood. Um, one of the things we'll be up doing, up Dating very shortly is making them available at lower super output area level as well. But in Southampton, which we're more familiar with over here, the areas that are red have the higher risk of um, food insecurity under the age of 65. So it's not very dissimilar to the index of multiple deprivation, in fact. And the ones that have the lines running across them also have the highest quintile of benefits claimants as well. In this case, in Southampton, it's 23.9 to 33% of the under 65 population claiming benefits. And then Suffolk, we've done the same thing here, but it's for um, the population age 65 and over. And again, here it doesn't correspond so neatly. The areas that are red are where there's the highest proportion of single pensioner households. And then where they've got the lines overlying it, that's where between 58 and 66% of the over 65 population are claiming some sort of benefit like 
um, pension credit, income-based pension credit. So these kind of maps can be used really effectively in local authorities to target resources beyond food banks. Um, in my local area here in Lymington, I live on the poor end of Lymington called Pennington, we've got a mobile food larder that comes out every Tuesday now. And again, these this kind of targeting can be done using maps like this to see where are the areas not currently served by food banks or other resources, but which we would expect to see more demand for food aid of some kind. And that brings me on to the next thing. So what are our responses? How are we, how are we responding to food insecurity in the country? So here's Southampton again. This is using um, a website I developed with Southampton City Council and Sustain to make this kind of risk measure easily accessible to anyone who doesn't have GIS software to, at their disposal. And this is showing the food insecurity risk of households, just the demographic risk um, as of December 2020. So again, it's in quintiles. You can see the same sort of areas being highlighted here to the extreme east and west. And then the dots here show us where the food banks are across Southampton, obviously not actually in the water, but to the nearest postcode. And you can see there's some areas like Thornhill and Hightown, which don't have anything locally. And over, way over here in Redbridge as well, there's a bit of a gap. But my point here is simply this, you know, once again, we have areas where there may not be necessarily the highest demand or highest need for food aid, but there's not anything present because there's no capacity in that particular location. And this is the kind of way that we've looked at this more locally and thought about, okay, well, what could we put in these areas instead? Or where could more support be provided? And again, it's a measure, it's a, a kind of balance of capacity and availability of space. But that's why it's so important to look beyond just where food banks are located. If we looked at where food banks were located, we would assume that food poverty was highest here, here, there, and over here, right? So we'd, we'd be missing out a lot of the higher risk areas very quickly. Some people would say that food banks are making the situation worse because they are taking the pressure off the government to do something more comprehensively. And um, their questions pose like, why don't we measure food insecurity consistently in the UK? A cynical answer would be because if we measure it, then it has something has to be done about it. The scale of the issue and the problem will be known. Um, if we don't know where food poverty is most likely to happen or where it's most in or where it's the prevalence is highest, then nothing can be done about it particularly. And again, most of the responses are very much led by the third sector. And then I pose a question around this kind of emerging new food aid environment where a lot more people are doing things like opening community fridges, and I'll explain that in a moment, and other things. Is that masking the kind of need within the community because the government does look at food bank use as a, as a proxy indicator for food insecurity? So it's fantastic that there's so much social good happening right now, but is it in fact making it look as though there's less pressure? And if you talk to food banks, you'll find out that actually last Christmas there was a dip in demand compared to previous years, which is weird, right? But it's not so weird because a lot of people had a bit more time on their hands and wanted to do something meaningful to help others around Christmas time. So there's, again, it's this uh, immense amount of food aid happening right around the same time. Food banks are not the only thing, though. Um, we're seeing a, an emergence of new options like food pantries. So Southampton City Mission will be opening a new food pantry on the 15th of April. And there's another one that's opened on, on the 12th of January. At a, along the avenue, I forget the exact location, and a food pantry is a different model where you pay a certain amount every week, say £2.50, and you can choose 10 items. So food banks, you tend to go and you might be able to give some indication about what you do and don't want to have in your in your box of goods, but in reality there's not a huge amount of choice. With food pantries, there's some more choice, so you're able to go and choose from, say, five different sections of food, 10 items. Um, the food pantry local to me is Kind of a different model altogether so you go there and you get you pay a certain amount of money you get a certain amount of goods but they're pre-selected goods and then you can choose fresh fruit and vegetables at the end so they're a little bit different there's also a different model where it's like a supermarket altogether but it's just heavily subsidized and much much cheaper and that was called a community shop the naming is a bit conflicting and it depends what part of the country you're in so it's a little bit hard these are the different types of models available and not all of them require referrals so although southampton city mission food banks and food pantry will require referral the um, Southampton Social Food Pantry does not require any kind of referral. You just simply go there and that's fine. And the same thing with uh, the fair share of food larder that goes down the street from me. So those are good. Um, community fridges are another one, which are a relatively new concept, although there's been quite a few in Dorset until there have been quite a few in Dorset. Um, and they are, again, completely free and there's no referral needed. So you simply go there and you pick up the food that's, that's there. And most of that food is sourced through redistribution charities like Fair Share. So Tesco calls up and says, we've got a ton of extra bananas. Do you want them? And they say, yes. And they go pick them up and they go into the community shop 
and anyone can go in off the street and go pick up what they wish, what they want from there. That's a community fridge model. Um, and what's nice about some of the community fridges locally in Dorset is that there's actually a garden around the corner which produces some of the, the fresh produce which then goes into the community fridge later on. So it's a very nice, very truly community-led organization. So we have lots of different um, ways of doing these things. And then, of course, there's things like we should be, hopefully, op offering con continued uplift of benefits, which has now happened for another six months. So people are given a bit more money. And I've put in here, basically, more money and trust people, because what we want to see is cash first food aid. People should be given more money. Then they can buy what they want, where they want, when they want, and how they want. The food aid model is nice and it makes people feel good. And it fills a gap and it redistribute surplus food, but you could ask whether there should be surplus food in the system to the extent it is now anyway. And is it giving supermarkets and other big food retailers kind of a way out of having to deal with their own um, issues around resourcing if they have so much excess food? Um, I'll go back to that point in a moment. So here's just another example of the different opportunities available. So there's Townsend Community Fridge, which is a, one of the examples of the free resources. You go there, you get your bread, your yogurt, whatever is available. Um, and then the food larders where there's again you pay some money and you get some food back out of it and you have some choice depending on which particular model you're in so as i mentioned a lot of that food comes from redistribution charities like fair share and it is good but then you start to delve a little bit deeper and jane midgley at newcastle is doing some really interesting work around this if you're interested um is this simply passing on the issue of food waste and this is food waste action week so it's certainly a, a very important topic to consider you hear stories about mountains of baked beans, a lot of tinned custard delivered to different parts of the country at various points in time because there was a surplus. Crumpets, so many crumpets, and bananas. So then suddenly there's all this extra food dumped on other organizations that they somehow have to deal with, whether they can get rid of it or not, give it away or not. So it's really good that we have this kind of distribution in place, that food's not going directly to a landfill. However, we need to be a little bit more critical about it and thinking around what are the real implications of giving surplus food to feed the poor, which is a pretty poor narrative altogether. There is national funding. So in addition, the government has sent money down to local authorities to spend as they see fit. This includes a holiday activities fund, which has been extended across 2021. And that's a total of 170 million pounds to go to local authorities to support things like holiday hunger activities, like the Saints Foundation runs here in Southampton. And that's for the different uh, school breaks, summer break, Easter break, and Christmas holidays. In addition, there is a winter support grant which needs to be spent by the end of this month, I believe. That was 220 million sent to the different local authorities across the country based on some measure of need is how much allocation they had. And as well as part of that, surplus food was redistributed. So there has been some national level work. We've probably seen a lot of the work that Marcus Rashford's been supporting around what does it look like? You know, what does food aid actually look like in practice? And here's the sort of examples that unfortunately we saw circulating on social media around the food boxes that were given out to families during um, the last holiday period, which is obviously quite insignificant. So some difficult questions to end with. Is it food security if people need to use food aid? I would say no. It's just uh, kind of creating a different situation. So People are not food secure if they're having to use food aid by the most clear definitions. What about people with special dietary needs? So gluten-free, vegetarians, anyone with, with different preferences for the food, that's not going to be met necessarily through the food aid that we have because you're going to either a surplus food redistribution point like a food larder and you can choose some options or you're going to a food bank. So it's not the best option. At least the food pantries and other places like that are higher agency and there's some transaction which does tend to have it makes them more sustainable longer term because money is actually changing hands. And also people report preferring that to a food bank because it's not a charity in the same way. There are other harder questions around the nutritional quality of the food that you access through any one of these options because most of them need to have a long shelf life because there's nowhere to store fresh produce, for example. So it's going to be things which have a lot of preservatives and again are tinned, UHT milk and so forth. And I asked the question about whether surplus food redistribution is the appropriate way to, as some people put it, address two problems, food waste and food poverty. And I would say, as you might have guessed, no. So just some kind of summary points and I will stop and take any questions. So how can we explain the rise of food insecurity in the UK? That's a good question. It's probably a, a series of factors which came together and created a perfect difficult situation for many families. And of course, food insecurity existed before 1999, but it's just become much more visible now. 
there are very clear health implications of food insecure, food poverty or food insecurity. First and foremost, mental health outcomes are much more negative for people who are experiencing food insecurity and knock on effects will then have an impact on their physical health later on. Are food banks making the situation worse? No, I don't think so. They are definitely filling a need that we have right now. But are they taking pressure off of other sectors which could be doing more to help, i.e. the national government perhaps? I would say yes, they, that is a consideration, but I would not blame the food banks for what they're doing. I'm in fact quite grateful for what they're doing to help a lot of people. And there are a range of current policy and charitable responses to food insecurity that I've outlined. And it's interesting to see the different things emerging, but actually what we should be moving towards is very much a cash first response to food insecurity and giving people more money in order to meet their needs as they see fit. And I think that is it. There's my references. So thanks very much for your time and I'll be happy to take any questions. All right. Thank you so much. Questions for is open. Yeah, Peter, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks a lot, Diana. Very interesting as always. When I was listening to that, something that occurred to me uh, was that we had a great success in the past with credit unions as a way of addressing problems with availability of money and debt and so forth. The idea being that you bypassed all of the formal banks and had a, um, a community based uh, system for investing and borrowing money. Do you think there's an opportunity here for uh, for local communities to take control of the food supply and the cost of food to local residents so that you could actually create a system that bypassed the, the profits of, uh, of larger shops and multinationals and actually allowed people to focus on local need and um, um, the ability to pay? Yes, that's a good question. And I would say there is definitely capacity for that. I mean, in North America, we have community supported agriculture, which is exactly that sort of model where people either come together collaboratively and grow food and sell on some of it. And you commit to buying a box of the fruit and veg, for example, every week, or it can be people support a farm directly by doing exactly the same sort of thing. I think there's certainly a lot of interest in having more community led agriculture and more mostly I would say what I've probably failed to say is that there's a lot of interest around community-led organization of new interventions to support food aid and that would be one of them so I think yes absolutely but the issue again is where are we going to have these so where can we get some free green space to use for example um, or how can we better support our local agricultural systems and engage them more effectively to then develop something which gives them a reasonable market for their goods that is reliable I think we could probably learn a bit from the pandemic in this respect because we probably have seen more people turn to local producers. So it'd be interesting to see how that goes. I don't, it's certainly worth exploring. And I think there is certainly some merit in it. I just don't know how practically it would work if it's tried, if we try to roll it out in too many places, but definitely start in a few. Thank you. So I've got a question, Diana. Um, I was interested in the community-led approaches, and I was wondering, typically, where the fund, whether there's any funding for that in the UK, or whether that tends to be on people's goodwill. So there's not usually a lot of funding available. Um, currently, there are £16 million pounds available to, to different food charities. But again, one of the challenges I've I've learned about from speaking to people is that there's a lot of good intentions, but they're not linked to a charity. So it's very hard to access these funds and it's hard to even open a bank account unless you are have charitable status. So one way that a lot of community groups are getting around this is to link in with another community group and then they kind of join forces to have a community fridge in something which is already which is already in place. And then that, that makes it more sustainable longer term. So I think probably the choice, the aim is to attach it to something else locally. OK, thank you. To Paul and then Mary. Hi, yeah, um, thank you, Donna. That was super interesting. Um, I was wondering if we 
I guess of how we might um, kind of measure or map the, the sort of different forms of capital, I suppose, enabling people to set up community supported agriculture, or you talked a bit about kind of food banks being not necessarily in the areas that need them, but being more in the areas where volunteers might be or churches. Um, yeah, just wondering kind of how we measure that and how we can kind of use what we do with that really. It's a good question. There are some good resources getting so they get getting set across. I think Dorset is one example where there's a, a lot of interest around food security and there are food poverty action plans being enacted in lots of local councils. One of those one aspect of those tends to be looking at the food system locally and thinking about areas where they could put more support to food aid, whether it's in a kind of systematic fashion or supporting different types of community organizations like community led agriculture. But I think what we need, our community supported agriculture. What we need to do is engage more effectively across the food system. So with local producers, as well as finding out what the local demand is, because it's one thing to get a lot of people that are growing carrots and onions and potatoes to redistribute them locally at a at a better price. But the other challenge is, it, you know, is there going to be a lot of demand for goat's cheese, which might be five pounds for a small piece? And that's not exactly filling the need of the people locally. So there needs to be a really good discussion between the community members who are wanting better resources for food what do they want and what do they need and what's on offer locally and how can we meet the kind of how can we fill the gap between yeah fantastic thank you and then mary if, if her hand is still up Oh dear, I guess we might <laughs> we might have lost Mary. All right, one any any we'll take one more question if there is. Otherwise, we will move on to everybody's three o'clock engagement and going once. All right, well, Diana, thank you so much for today. Um, and oh, there she is. She's back. Mary's back. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, you get you get the closing you get the closing question. Oh yeah, I just went completely wonky and everybody froze up just as just as Diana was answering Paul's question. Diana, thank you. It was very interesting and very sobering. It's probably not quite a fair question, but on, you know, at, at first glance, the idea of supermarket over buying in and its redistribution of those foodstuffs to, to food banks or fair show or whatever. Sounds like a good idea, but you were clearly not very enamored of it. And I I just wondered what you th what you thought would be, you know, in a in a better world, how this would would work. I think in a better world we wouldn't have a situation where there's so many extra there's so much extra food in the system because what we hear about from food banks is they suddenly get a glut of things like tent custard, which gives them a massive issue for storage space and why on earth is this happening or sauerkraut was another example locally so sauerkraut i love um but that's definitely an acquired taste and it came to them because it was mislabeled so suddenly they've got all this food which is no longer the issue of the supermarket which had the mislabeled goods but they've now given it to someone else who then has to store it so they can get rid of it so the situation is probably better responsibility for the industry and the corporate social responsibility can't always be a buyout of let's get rid of this and give it to someone else and we've done a good thing by donating x amount of goods which we can probably use as some sort of tax write-off that's my rather cynical and grumpy view on this one yeah i mean is it is it partly that we the supermarket consumers should should just not plan to have 25 different kinds of custard and also that sometimes yes. there will be gaps on the shelves <laughs> because the supermarkets are making a much tighter margin about what's consumed um and instead of saying it's quite profitable to throw it all away which is presumably what they're they're doing or um, they stick to a biodigester so you're absolutely right actually i'm being a bit unfair in the supermarkets who typically have a profit margin of about three percent so their profit margins are extreme you're right um which is unfortunate for them and so there is a responsibility for the consumers to perhaps expect something different but mm. i just don't want to do too much on the consumers on this one i don't think mm. yeah good point thanks. it was really interesting thanks
Thanks. Okay, I think we lost Eva as well. <laughs> so I'm just going to say that we're done now. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming to see me and listen. Um, oh, sorry, Eli, I didn't see you for a minute there. A failure. <laughs> so, well, thank you. Thank you so much for for this afternoon, and we will we'll we'll leave it there and we'll put it on the Internet for safekeeping <laughs> and uh, and and thank you again. Great, thanks. Have a good afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks, Diane. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.